There are people all around us who need to hear about God's love for them. The best place to start is right next door. Today, Pastor Lemming continues his message on loving where we live. You've seen a number of stories like this over the years. If I give you this one, you're going to be reminded of some others that we've heard about from the news. But this is one that especially struck me when I had heard about the story. It happened a number of years ago to a young woman who was in her late 20s. And as she was going home, on her way home, a man attacked her, began to assault her, and began to stab her. Again and again, assaulting her and stabbing her and assaulting her and stabbing her. It took over a half an hour to murder her. It took over a half an hour to murder her. She was screaming repeatedly for somebody to come to my aid. Somebody help. I don't know what all the words were that she was saying. I don't know all the things that she was yelling, but she was screaming. You knew she was in trouble. And here's the troubling thing. There were 38 people who were looking from their apartment windows who were interviewed by the police. 38 people looking on from their apartment windows watching the crime take place. And not one, not even one, bothered to even call the police. Let alone go down and do something to try to save this woman's life. 38 people interviewed by the police that saw what was taking place, looking at it through the windows of their apartments, didn't even call the police. They saw, but they didn't see. They're like the Levite and the priest, and they see something, but they don't see the value of the person. They don't see the worth of the individual. They don't see the image of God in that individual. And when they were interviewed as to why they hadn't done anything, the most common response they heard back was, we just didn't want to get involved. We just didn't want to get involved. If we're going to obey this command of Jesus, or this command of, of God, that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, it means that we've got to open our eyes and we've got to see those people that are laying in the gutters of the streets today are people that matter to God. Those people who have a needle in their arms and are overdosed and they desperately need a Narcan treatment to revive them are people who bear the image of God. Those people who are going through the difficulties of life and they barely have their heads above the poverty line are people that matter to God. And we as the church have got to open our eyes and we've got to see. We've got to quit burying our heads in the sand. We've got to quit acting as if we didn't notice. We've got to quit saying, I just don't want to get involved. That's really not my place to get involved. We have to open our eyes and see. But do you know what really makes the difference in this story? And do you know what's about to happen that Jesus is about to say that is scandalous? Jesus is about to make a hero out of someone in this story that is absolutely scandalous to the Jewish people. And as you already know, it's a Samaritan. I don't have time to take you back to give you the history of the Samaritans, but just for the shortened version, it's Jews who intermarried with Gentiles so that you have a mixed race of people. And the result of that is what? The Jews dislike the Samaritans, and the Samaritans dislike the Jews. You remember in John chapter 4 when Jesus goes through Samaria and sits down at the well, and the Samaritan woman comes out, and Jesus says, would you give me something to drink? And the woman says, what are you doing, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? Because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That was the temperament. That was the spirit. That was the attitude. And yet, what is Jesus about to do? Jesus is about to go past uh, somebody who is a priest and somebody who is a Levite who has no question as to their nationality. 
And he's about to use a character that is scandalous when the Jews thought of it. Notice he goes on, verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, here's what makes the difference. He had compassion. Will you circle the word compassion? He had compassion. What was it that the priest lacked? Compassion. What was it the Levite lacked? Compassion. What was it this lawyer asking these questions lacks? Compassion. He lacked compassion. But there was a Samaritan, and this Samaritan comes down this road. He sees this man, and what is scandalous in the story is that the one who has compassion is the one that the Jews, for the most part, despised. That brings me to my second statement this morning. Not only have, do we have to open our eyes and see, we have to open our hearts and feel. We not only have to open our eyes and see, we have to open our hearts and feel. What does it mean to have compassion? It means to be moved emotionally. It means to be moved deeply within yourself. It means to have pity. It means to feel the hurt in your own heart that somebody else is feeling. Now, I understand that's difficult. Again, we have compassion fatigue. A lot of us have compassion fatigue. There isn't a, a week that goes by. Most of the time, it's not a day that goes by. That there isn't somebody who calls me or contacts me or comes to see me whose life isn't falling apart in some fashion. They're not broken in some fashion. And some nights you go to bed and you think, do I have any more compassion to give? And sometimes you feel the same way. Do I have any more compassion to give? But I want to remind you that Jesus looked on people with what? He looked on people with compassion. He looked on cities, and he saw people, and he had compassion on those people. You remember the story that Jesus tells a little bit later in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son? And the son takes his inheritance, and he goes down, and he squanders his living so that he has nothing left, and he's down here in a pig pen, and he comes to himself, and he says, you know what I've got to do? I've got to go home, and even if it means being a servant in my father's house, it's better than where I am now. And the son begins making his way home, and the, you read between the lines, you know that the father is out there every day looking for his son to come home, and when he sees his son crest that hill, Though that son has wasted his entire life and wasted everything about his life, when the father sees his son coming, what does it say about him? It says he had compassion on him. He had compassion on him. And Jesus had compassion on people again and again. Aren't you thankful for the compassion that Jesus had for us? Squire Parsons wrote a song that says this, He came to me, oh, he came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. He came to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to his side, where today in his sweet love I now abide. Do you know what brought Jesus from heaven? It's his love for us. It's his compassion on mankind. He sees people who are broken. And rather than seeing them and walking on by them, he came into our world and he suffered the most horrendous death you could possibly suffer and took upon himself the penalty of our sins and was buried in a, in, a, in a tomb and raised that third day victorious over sin and over death. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we're going to love where we live, we've got to open our eyes and we've got to see the people in our neighborhoods and we've got to see the people in our offices and we've got to see the people that we call our friends and we've got to open our hearts and feel 
We've got to ask God to help us to feel what they're feeling, to have pity upon them, to see the desperation of their circumstances. They don't know what they're looking for. They don't know why their life is empty. They don't understand how the things they're using will only run out in the end and provide no real satisfaction. And if we don't love where we live, where our hearts are opened so that we can feel what they feel, we'll never be moved to go to them. Here's a man in this story, this, this story where Jesus says it's a good Samaritan or a Samaritan. By the way, to the Jews, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. That's what we call this story. But as far as the Jews were concerned, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. But let me ask you a question. If you were the man who had been beaten and stripped and robbed and left for dead, do you think you'd care whether it was a priest or a Levite, or a Gentile, or a Samaritan that came to help you? What it takes is compassion. It takes people who look around and recognize and seek to try to feel what other people are feeling so that you have a desire to do something to help them and to bless them. Terry Muck is an author and he tells the story about a man that lived in a neighborhood, and he was neighbors with an unbelieving family. These two families talked over the fence, and they had things in common in that respect. They shared, you know, the, the tools of grass cutting and things of that nature. But that's about the extent of their conversation. They just sort of talked in generalities to each other over the fence. But then the unbelieving neighbor's wife was stricken with cancer. Within three months, she was gone. She was dead. This unbelieving man writes, I was in total despair. I went through the funeral preparations in the service, uh, in the, in the service like I was in a trance. After the service, I went to the path along the river and walked all night. I wonder what he was thinking about doing. But I didn't walk alone. My neighbor followed me. I guess he stayed all night. He didn't speak. He didn't even walk beside me. He just followed me. When the sun finally came up over the river, he came over and said, let's go get some breakfast. I go to church now, my neighbor's church. A faith that can produce that kind of love is something I want to find out more about. I want to love and be loved like that for the rest of my life. You realize most people don't feel loved. They feel used. They feel beaten, but they don't feel loved. Would you be willing to give up a whole night to follow a neighbor that you are concerned might be seeking to harm himself in the depth of his own grief? And then when the morning light comes, offering to go get breakfast together and helping to begin a pathway toward healing of going through his grief and helping him to find that the Lord loves him even though his wife is now gone from him, would we be willing to have that kind of compassion? We have to open our eyes and see. We have to open our hearts and feel. To open our hearts and feel. The old saying is that people don't want to know, what, they don't want to know that uh, you care until they, they don't want to know what you know until they know that you care. Did I get that right? They don't want to know what you know until they know that you care. Who are you caring for today? Who are you reaching out to? Who are you seeking to feel what they're going through? Who are you sympathizing with, having empathy for? Who is it that you've opened your heart so that you can feel what they're feeling? Well, it didn't stop there. You'll notice it goes on. Verse 34, so he, Jesus telling this story, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal before him uh, and brought him, I should say, to an inn. And here's the words, took care of him. If you look down in verse 35 in the middle, uh, he tells the innkeeper, take care of him. But what does he do? He goes to him. 
He bandages up the wounds. He pours in oil and wine. He sets him on his own animal, and he brings him to that inn. And then he pays the expense for that man to stay in that inn. Not only do we have to open our eyes and see and open our hearts and feel, we have to open our hands and help. Did you hear me? We have to open our hands and help. And here is a man who had every reason. The other two men, you would have thought this being one of their own brethren, would have stopped and helped him. But here is a man, the good Samaritan, who could have said, you know what, the way they've treated us through the years, I don't think I'll do anything for this man. I'm going to be the one that walks on the other side of the street and walks down the street. But he didn't do that. Can you imagine the Jewish audience that's listening to this right now? Just imagine, you're the Jewish audience. You're listening to Jesus tell this story, and he just made a hero out of a Samaritan. It would be a little bit like making a hero out of an Islamic terrorist. If you want to get the idea of how they would have felt and how scandalized they would have felt at this moment. And they, they couldn't believe that Jesus w- was saying these things, that a, that a Samaritan went and did what our own brethren weren't willing to do. And this man not only opened his eyes and his saw and opened his heart and he felt, but this man opened his hands and he helped. I mean, this was no easy task. Probably the strips that he used to, to bind the wounds were torn off of his own clothes not likely that he was carrying extra strips for the purpose of being able to bind up somebody's wounds that day, likely torn off of his own, the the oil and the wine. It softens up the wounds that were on his body. The wine is a disinfectant to try to keep uh, the infection out. Uh, He puts him on his own animal. Now the good Samaritan is the man who is walking the animal along. He's in the servile position while this one that he's just rescued is riding on the animal. And in this servile position, he brings the man to the inn and he takes care of him. Did you see that at the end of verse 34? He doesn't just leave him with somebody and walk away. First, he takes care of him. He opened his hands and he helped. He opened his hands And he helped. You see, when you start seeing people who are broken and beaten and left by the world around them, even though they don't know what's wrong or why they're in their condition, they only know that their uh, their life is ebbing away from them, and you begin to open your heart so that you can feel what they must feel. I hear some of the stories that are told to me through some of the ministries of our church about women that are in prostitution in the kind of circumstances out of which they have grown up. Maybe if you stopped and listened to their story, you'd feel a little differently about rescuing those women, right? But then they opened their hands. He opened his hands, and he went to help Let me bind up your wounds. Let me pour in some disinfectant. Let me put some oil on it that'll help to begin the healing process. Let me get you to a safe place where you'll be okay. Let me put my hands to this. Did the Levite do that? Did did the priest do that? Did the preacher do that? Did the members of the church do that? It was the least likely person who did that. He put his hands to the task in order to help a man who was beaten and he was broken, even though they were by nature enemies of one another. You have watched, I know, the various presidents give the State of the Union. I don't know if there was one this year or not. I don't remember there being one. But we've seen the State of the Union addresses by the presidents, and you know that generally at some point the president's going to stop his speech, whatever he's saying, and he's going to point to somebody that's up in the gallery who is an American hero, not a military person, just an everyday, ordinary kind of an individual who's an American hero, have him to stand or have her to stand, and everybody's going to applaud that person. It was President Ronald Reagan who started that tradition. He introduced a man by the name of Lenny Skutnik. 
And it became so popular with the following presidents that the reporters, when they were moving toward that day of the address, the State of the Union address, that they would start asking the question, who is the, who is the Skutnik this year? Who is the Skutnik this year? Who is the hero this year? Do you remember Lenny Skutnik? Google his name. S-K-U-T-N-I-K. Lenny Skutnik. Google his name and watch the video for yourself. Lenny Skutnik was a federal worker who was walking down the street just minding his own business until on that particular day, Air Florida Flight 90 crashed into the Potomac River. The flight had just taken off. It was going from Washington to Florida. It developed ice on its wings, and it couldn't get elevation. It was just trying to clear the Washington's 14th Street Bridge, but instead it went down into the Potomac. In those moments, there were six people. Everyone else died. There were six people who were thrown out of that plane into the freezing waters of the Potomac River. They began immediately working. The EMS began immediately working to try to bring those six people, but their rafts, they couldn't get over the ice. They couldn't get out to them. And finally, they get an, a helicopter that comes out and lowers down a rope and they asked the people, these, one of these six, to hold on to the rope. They only had one rope to begin with, one rope, to hold on to the rope. And they would lift them up out of the water, and they would pull them over and drop them on shore. And then they would go back to try to rescue another one. But one of those that was in the river was a woman. She was so frozen. 30 minutes of, of time in, in that river, and you're dead. She was getting close to that. She was already beginning to submerge, a little at a time submerging. There were people on the bridge above who were watching this unfold, and they were cheering for her, grab the rope, grab the rope, grab the rope. But she was so cold, she couldn't get her arms up to grab the rope for herself so that she could be pulled to safety. That's when Lenny Skutnik realized that something had to be done. Just a common, ordinary kind of a guy. Nothing all that special about him. He's just like you and me. He saw that it, something had to be done, and this woman was going to drown in a matter of the next moment or two. You know what he does? He tears off those outer garments, and he dives into the water of the Potomac River. He swims out to this woman. He takes hold of her, and he pulls her back to the shore and saves her life. Of the six people, five of them were saved that day. That one woman was saved by Lenny Skutnik. It was a man who saw that there was something that needed to be done, who had compassion in his heart, and he opened his hands and helped. He opened his hands and helped. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're, you're going to be confronted with something as dramatic as that, though I hope if you and I are confronted by something that dramatic that we might be willing to do something like that. That would have been a great place for an amen. I hope that we would be brave enough to be able to do that. Just go listen to what Lenny Skutnik has to say about that rescue. Just Google it. It's on YouTube. It's an incredible thing to listen to a man who was willing to open his hands and he was willing to help. The president called him a hero. Do you know what Jesus would have called him? Jesus would have said, he's a good neighbor. He's, he's, a, good, he's a good neighbor. He's a good Samaritan. Jesus would have recognized him and called him something different than a hero, but Jesus would have recognized him because there was a man who opened his eyes and saw, and a man who opened his heart and felt, and a man who opened his hands and helped. I, I'm going to stop the message at this point. And we're going to pick up the other three points next week. But we gave you something when you came in a few minutes ago, a card. It says, love where you live. And on the other side of that card, there's a place for you to write the names of people people that are across the fence from you in your own neighborhood, people that are just down the street from you, or maybe if you live in a rural setting, it may be a pasture field or two down, but you know who they are, 
and they know who you are, and you have general conversation every once in a while, it may be somebody that you work with, it may be somebody in your own family, but I'm asking you to take this card, and I'm asking you between now and next message to write the names of those people on this card and to promise that you're going to pray for those people and you're going to pray for open doors. And that when those open doors come, that you'll have the eyes to see and the heart to feel and the hands that are ready to help. And you'll say, I'm going to pray for these people. You're going to put it in your Bible. It's going to become a bookmark for you. Because every time you open your Bible, you're going to see that card and you're going to tell yourself and remind yourself, God expects me to love where I live. I don't have to go to the other side of the world. God calls some people to do that. For us, it's to the other side of the street or to the other side of the fence or the other side of the office hallway. And we see and we feel and we put out our hands and we say, let me help you. Let me help you. And you commit yourself to praying again and again and again for these dear people. You know why I want you praying for them? You say, I'm not going to write that down. I'm going to keep it in my mind. You won't pray for them, and you won't see when they have a need. If you don't write it down, and you don't bring it out, and you don't call their name out, and visually look at it, and verbally say it again and again, you won't see, you won't feel, and you won't put your hands out to help. You start praying. You start thinking about these people on a regular basis, and all of a sudden, you know what happens? This has happened so many times to people that I know. All of a sudden, they've been praying for somebody. They've been thinking about somebody on a regular basis. All of a sudden, they see an open door, and they see an opportunity, and the opportunity is for me to love where I live. I don't have to go to the other side of the world. He put me in my mission field. It's my neighborhood. It's my workplace. It's my school. That's my place. That's my place to love. And I'm going to start loving people right where I am. Thanks for joining us today. And we invite you to come back each Sunday for more messages. If you would like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We would love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.